with the Morphing Gamepad is a controller which launched in 2017. It is the showpiece of the current episode, because there was a planned light gun attachment for the grifter, and because prior release, it was changed into a gyro gun. The video starts with the history of this controller, goes over a close look on the hardware, to a section about the performance. The Grifter Morphing Gamepad is the brainchild of Paul Weatherstone and began on Kickstarter in February 2015. The main idea was to offer a high quality split controller, which could be used in multiple configurations in an ergonomic manner. The least unusual way to use the Grifter would be combining the two pieces to a single controller. The envisioned connector piece would have allowed the user to hold both pieces at a slight angle, which was thought to be more ergonomic than a flat design. Without the connecting piece, the halves can be held however the player wishes. The more interesting use cases are omitting one of the halves and to substitute it for another input device, such as a mouse or a joystick. None of those concepts were exactly new, as split controllers were already available, such as the 2003 released Hurry Separate controller and the 2010 released Split Fish Dual SFX. Not to forget that Nintendo was popularizing split controller gameplay since 2006 with its Nintendo Wii. Even the half gamepad half mouse use case was already served at this time by companies such as Splitfish with their 2006 released Edge FX controller. Nevertheless, the Kickstarter crowd was very attracted to the campaign, which almost raised double of its initial £65,000 goal. This surpassed the stretch goal threshold for the so-called antler light gun attachment, which was an independently powered three-armed array of infrared LEDs, which could be used with an IR-sensible camera in order to track motion, much like the RGTG1, which I have shown in episode 145. The Grifter team took inspiration from the IR head tracking community and based the antlers on headphone attachments, which are common therein. Apart from light gun applications, it was envisioned that such controllers could be a viable option for the upcoming virtual reality head-mounted devices. In the campaign, Paul said that the left-hand side of the controller already completed the production stage and some initial playtesting. Based on the feedback, he wanted to change minor details such as the joystick top, but otherwise claimed to be able to simply mirror copy all the parts of the left-hand unit to obtain the right-hand piece. Apart from the production itself, the raised funding just needed to suffice this mirroring process and to the design of the interconnecting centerpiece. Unfortunately, however, many unforeseen difficulties arose, which put the project into financial trouble. In May 2015, more production units of the left side were manufactured and underwent stress testing. Drop tests revealed that the push shoulder button was prone to break at excessive force. It was decided to redesign that portion and while doing so, the input was changed from a capacitive sensor to a push button switch, which demanded changes to the PCBs. While having to change the PCBs anyways, the controller was updated with a gyroscope module. It took until August to account for the arisen difficulties. In November, updates referred to severe conflicts with the manufacturing partner of the injection molding tools. In January, it became clear that a new partner had to be sourced to make the injection molds. In February, somewhat of a feature creep took place, which did not consume time, but further funding. The joysticks were reshaped again, and springs and switches were exchanged. Bluetooth was added to the controller, which demanded a PCB redesign. The antlers were made more complex in order to achieve compatibility with Oculus VR products. A batch of 200 complete both-sided controllers were made and underwent testing in July. The findings revealed problems with Bluetooth interferences and latency issues. Two buttons tended to get stuck and the amount of travel for the trigger was deemed too high. In August, an interference issue between 2.4G and Bluetooth was detected, which was so severe that the idea of supporting both was dropped. Instead, efforts were made to develop two distinct boards. In September, however, it became evident that Bluetooth remained troublesome on a software level when connecting both halves of the controller. Bluetooth was just working when using a single piece. Later, apparently Bluetooth support was completely dropped. Updates became more rare and contained less information until January 2017, 
when it was stated that 227 single left-hand units were sent to Bacos. Sales of the left half on Amazon started. In February 2017, the company Grifter Limited dissolved. The last update came in April, where Paul stated that he had to produce 2,000 left-hand units to meet the minimum order quantity and that the initial cost of ordering those was exceeding what was received through Kickstarter. He said that he would have to wait until all units were sold before being able to produce the right-hand side and the mid-piece. Unfortunately, sales on Amazon weren't stellar, as potential customers feared to be stuck with an incomplete left-hand side, if not enough units are sold, and because multiple negative reviews accumulated, which talked about connection issues, battery problems, and receiving dead on arrival products. If the reviews can be believed, there were severe quality issues. Seemingly, the remaining stock of Grifter gamepads went to Poland, from where it was sold through the world seller HMX24 in the year 2020. I contacted Paul and he told me that currently the project is on ice in lack of funding, but that the tooling and plans are ready for deployment even in Resto is found. Unfortunately, this left 1,215 backers of the original campaign unserved and unrefunded. Just 235 people backed and received the left-hand side unit, which combined with the apparent quality issues and low number of sales after the campaign, makes the Grifter Morphing gamepad very rare today. Visually, the controller reminds me a lot of the Splitfish Dual FX prototype, which was a LCD-compatible light gun. The silicon-made grip piece feels very sleek and is modular. It was odd to be offered in various sizes, with an additional form-your-own-grip option. Underneath is the battery compartment, which still refers to the once planned but never released Bluetooth functionality. The independently mapped rubber dome versions of the B and A button, the convex joystick head, and the modular cushion of the push shoulder button were made of the same comfortable material as the grip. At the bottom of the analog, clickable joystick are independently mapped rubber dome versions of X and Y. Those protrude at different depths to maximize the ergonomics. Likewise, the D-pad cap for the mechanical button cluster is unlike anything I have ever seen before. Each of the four main direction beads ends at a different height, radially around the thumb. In the center is a smooth circle for orientation. In the corners are tall poles, which make it easier to press the D-pad diagonally. The D-pad disc is removable and can be exchanged for a 4 buttons diamond cluster, which is labeled using the Xbox colors and nomenclature. A PlayStation version was prototyped, but was never made available to the public. The height of the button circles has the same unusual traits as the D-pad beads, but here it's not as noticeable. This piece is based on a clicky 8-way mechanical digital joystick, which can be pressed in at the center. The feeling is a lot different from having an array of four distinct rubber dome buttons. The closest thing that comes to my mind is the mechanical D-pad of the Neo Geo CD joypad, but it's still not quite the same. The analog potentiometer-based trigger is linear and devoid of any tactility. At its opposite side is a push-button switch-based shoulder button, which is supposed to be pressed in with the back of the index finger. The three buttons at the top of the controller are also push-button based. Aside from start and select, one button acts as power and profile selection button. Inputs are given via different kinds of long presses. The gyroscope module can be toggled on or off by simultaneously pressing start and select. At the nozzle of the Grifter Morphing gamepad is a USB Micro-B socket over which it is charged. The unreleased antler accessory was supposed to be slipped over the nozzle and would have contained its own battery to power itself. Three infrared LEDs would have emitted light, which would then have been picked up by a camera at the screen, which would have calculated where the gun is aiming at, its approximate orientation and its distance. By modulating the light spots, the controller potentially would have been compatible to the Oculus VR ecosystem. The antler is based on attachable accessories for headsets, as they are used by the RER head tracking community. This community got a major boost in 2001, when people started to use an assessive technology product, which was made by NaturalPoint, which is better known for its OptiTrack products. 
the assistive technology product eventually evolved to become the Trek IR system, which was fairly successful within the niche. In the Grifter campaign videos, the free software OpenTrack has been used with the Antler, and that's why I was also using it for my tests. The Antler got very close to being released and its Amazon page already went up. As I unfortunately lack the Antler, I decided to explore the light gun use case with a USB parrot head tracking clip instead. My particular unit is called Dun Track R and was made by Dun Engineering. It came with a Velcro attachable base which can host the adjustable ball joint of the light source. Although OpenTrack supports V remotes as tracking device, I used my ELP IR camera instead. The software is able to translate the sensed light points to relative position mouse inputs. The software is able to translate the sensed light points to relative position mouse inputs as direct input. This has the benefit that relative position gun games such as Galgun Double Piece are supported, but sadly, games which don't cope with direct input remain inaccessible. OpenTrack offers a fair selection of tracking smoothing algorithms and allows the user to control the attached camera in a myriad of ways. The movement to mouse translation layer can be adapted in software using custom nonlinear curves. As of making this video, OpenTrack solely supports relative mouse positions, which is an issue as soon as the gun aims off screen. This is an inherent problem of all relative gun controllers, which I have discussed in more detail in episode 158. To blame the Grifter Morphing Gamepad for this would be unreasonable, as it was ought to be followed up with bespoke software, which would have handled the tracking. In lack of the latter, I used OpenTrack and I liked what I experienced. I prefer this configuration over the Stormlight Gun X FPS and over any gyroscope gun. The Grifter Morphing Gamepad connects to computer or console hosts via a 2.4G USB receiver stick. It can be set to one of three modes, a mouse and keyboard human interface device, as Microsoft Direct Input, which is a DirectX API component, and as its successor, which is known as X Input. I put the unusual D-pad and button cluster through my gold standard testing procedure, which is playing Konami's Contra on a NAS emulator. For me it worked very well, but that might be influenced by the fact that I love the Neo Geo CD joypad. The gyro functionality of the Grifter controller works very well, which makes sense considering it is using the same in even sense MPU-6500 module, which powers my custom steam gun, which I have shown in episode 109. The gyro tracking feels stable and less prone to drifting than comparable controllers. Sadly, there is a huge design oversight. There is no temporary gyro cutoff button and the joystick can't be redundantly mapped to control the mouse. Either of those is a necessary prerequisite for any gyro controller, as drift is an inherent problem of the technology, no matter the quality of the sensor. Overall I enjoyed using the Grifter controller. Its designer Paul Weatherstone attempted to create a very ergonomic controller and I think he succeeded big time in this goal without overdoing it. The Grifter Morphing Gamepad was shipped in a plain cardboard box. On the sides are logos and a QR code. On the top is a simple sketch of the controller. This is the end of the review. My name is Ben. I thank you for viewing.